Whether casting an architectural element such as a staircase tread, a manufacturing piston, a gear, or even a cannon, the metal foundry process is essentially the same as it has been for thousands of years. With roots reaching back to 1847, Tennessee's own Clarksville Foundry is one of the oldest operating iron foundries in the United States. The same foundry that today produces a variety of components used in industrial, architectural, and artistic applications once cast munitions used during the American Civil War. The Faust family has been involved in foundry operations since 1907. Current president, Charlie Faust, is the third generation of his family to head Clarksville Foundry. Throughout the years, the foundry industry in America has faced changes in technology, increased foreign competition, and more challenging environmental regulations. However, one thing that has remained constant is the metal casting process. A component for casting can begin with an object to copy, a sketch, or simply an idea, which is interpreted into a three-dimensional pattern, usually from a drawing. The casting of a replica 1841 six-pounder cannon, like the type used in the Mexican War or the American Civil War, began with a dimensional drawing from a history book. The first step in making the pattern for the cannon was to laminate together wood slats to form a large block. The laminated block was then turned on a lathe to create a full-scale, three-dimensional pattern. Because of its size, the cannon pattern was created in sections. The wood pattern sections are attached to a wood base to create the mold, which will be enclosed in a steel frame called a flask. A release agent containing powdered aluminum is applied to the pattern to keep the sand from sticking to it. The steel flask for the mold was preheated before the molding process to help cure the sand mold. The frame is then attached to the pattern to contain the sand. A mixture containing silica sand, a binder, and a catalyst is hand-packed around the pattern in the flask to create the mold. The binder and catalyst act to glue the sand together so it holds its shape during the pouring process. When the pattern is removed, the impression in the hardened sand will hold the molten metal. A mold wash is applied to seal the surface of the mold. A second wash prevents the metal from burning into the sand. These make the casting smoother and prevent it from fusing to the sand. The mold is then thoroughly dried. In the Civil War era, cannons were typically poured as a solid form. The firing tube, called a bore, was then machined using a drill. In this modern reproduction cannon, a steel tube is used for the bore. It requires less molten material and eliminates the time involved in boring the cannon. The process is more efficient and the resulting piece is far stronger and more precise. Pieces of tubing are welded onto the bore in precise locations to form the trunnions. The trunnions support the tube during the pour and act as the external supports to the finished cannon tube. To seal the end of the steel tube in the rear of the cannon, a breech plug is machined to the precise internal radius of the tube. Silica sand packed into the tube prevents molten metal from filling the bore. Preheating the steel tube prevents splatter when the 2500 degree molten metal is poured around it. The steel tube is inserted into one half of the mold. 
Adhesive is spread and the mold is assembled. The mold is tipped at roughly 15 degrees. The slope helps the liquid metal to flow into all areas. Weights are set on top of the mold to prevent separation during the pouring process. Meanwhile, steel bushelling is melted in the furnace. Magnesium is added to the treatment ladle and the molten metal is combined with it. The material is then transferred to the pouring ladle and alloys are added. For the reproduction model 1841 six-pounder cannon, carbon and silicon are added to produce ductile iron. Ductile iron provides strength and flexibility that was unavailable in earlier castings. Ductile iron was not invented until 1943. So in the 1840s, this type cannon would have been made with the more brittle gray cast iron. More precise metallurgy, higher quality materials, and more efficient processes allow us to produce replicas of historic items that are even more durable than the originals. By the next day, the metal has solidified. The mold and casting are still hot at about 500 degrees, but they are cool enough to be separated in a process called the shakeout. Components that are unusually thick can take several weeks before the casting is set, and the mold is cool enough for removal. After removal from the mold, the casting is weighed and the result recorded. The casting is transferred to the blast cabinet where it is treated with shot blast to remove any remaining sand from the casting. After shot blasting, the piece undergoes grinding to remove and smooth the parting lines where the two sections of the mold meet during the pour. Final finishing of many castings often includes powder coating. Powder coating is a mixture of finely ground particles of pigment and resin, producing a uniform, durable, attractive finish that is resistant to chipping, scratching, fading, and wearing. To complete the reproduction cannon, the tube is mounted onto a reproduction Civil War era gun carriage. Of course, the true test of a cannon is the firing. Munitions trained Civil War reenactors from Porter's Battery assembled in full battle preparation to test fire the reproduction six pounder cannon. The setting is Fort Defiance in Clarksville, Tennessee, home of the Clarksville Foundry. At the beginning of the Civil War in 1861, Fort Defiance was a Confederate stronghold on the Cumberland River. In 1862, Clarksville was captured by Federal forces and held until the war's end in 1865. Clarksville Foundry has been in continuous operation ever since. We manufactured the replica cannon because it's an interesting, familiar object it recognizes the era of our original operations and commemorates local history. Fire! Secure the peace! Now, as a 21st century business, Clarksville Foundry celebrates its links to the past through its reproductions of historic castings. The company also fabricates custom components for a variety of industrial and manufacturing applications, 
Many of these castings are used in high-tech applications, including robotics and alternative energy fuel cells. The future remains bright for one of Tennessee's oldest ongoing businesses.